Welcome to Support Life, a program focusing on current social issues from a life-affirming perspective. I'm Gavin Bolch, and my guest is Anne Lastman. Welcome, Anne. Hi, Gavin. So again, we've got good Italian stock that I'm talking to. Yes, it is. It's the best. You know, it's not bad. I keep running into it. Um, and I'm enjoying who I meet from that great country. Lovely. When did you arrive here? 1957. I am Australian. Yes. Yes. Okay. I was only 10 years old when I came here. Okay. And that was over Perth? I arrived in Perth um, um, with mum mm -hmm. and my younger brother. Dad had already been here. He'd come after the war. He came to, um, to work after the war and buy a house. And then mum and myself and my brother came out. Yes, by, you know, those ships that took a hundred years and that <laughs> seemed forever. Yeah. Uh -huh. And that's courage, isn't it? To, to come out and start another life for family yet to arrive. Mm, it, it was, it seemed a long time and coming to a, a land so far away where there were no relatives mm. here. We left everybody behind, yeah. uh, grandparents and aunties and uncles. And, and yeah, I never saw my grandparents again, oh. ever. Okay. Yeah. Learning English as a child, how did that go? That was very difficult because you were, in those days, you were plonked into a school. I remember St. Bridget's West Perth. Um, you were just put there. There were no special teachers to help the students. Mm. You were just put there and you had to manage and you had to learn mm -hmm. and you had to pass. Okay, how did you handle the playground and I guess there'd be some bullying of sorts as we would see it today? There was. Mm -hmm. um, it was very difficult. Um, there was. Mm -hmm. um, so if it doesn't kill you, it makes you a stronger person. Is that does that That's ring true? true? It does. It rings true. I remember um, incidences, especially with the lunch issues that mum um, or the Italian mums or Greek mums, um, for example, would put the Italian bread with salami and, and uh, other Italian stuff in and we would long for um, the nice, pretty bread without crusts and that black stuff. The black stuff. The black stuff, which everybody else had. But mum wouldn't give us that black stuff with the pretty bread. Mm, it's called axle grease and it's great for <laughs> soldiers that need to have some light face Yeah, makeup. but everybody else had that, you see. But we were having that salami. And then in order to look normal, we'd throw away our Italian bread with salami and have nothing all day, you see. Well, as you talk to me, I'm already salivating about salami and <laughs> the cheese and the olives and the crusty bread. But you see, 10-year-olds and 9-year-olds and 12-year-olds and don't feel that way. They just want to feel normal. They want to feel the same. Mm. Um, and other Italian goodies, biscottis, that mum used to make. And the children don't want biscottis. They want the milk arrowroot, mm -hmm. like everybody else had. And so you threw them away as you went along the road. So. Okay, now talking about throwing things away, there was a, a point later on in your life, much, much later, mm -hmm. and uh, you found something that was thrown away. It was a scrunched up piece of paper that you unravelled. What, what was that I about? I can't tell you anything, can I? <laughs> yes, that was something that changed my life. Okay, so what I, was it? Um, we moved to Melbourne and I... We settled in Glen Waverley and I 
I remember the first Sunday I went to Mass and I saw a piece of scrunched up paper on the floor and I just picked it up in a way just to throw it away because it was didn't look right. And I opened and I looked at it and it was a piece of paper that spoke of a conference, a day conference in um, Oakley, Sacred Heart Church, Oakley Parish or Hall. And it was a Catholics United for the Faith Conference, and I remember it clearly. And it was to be um, uh, different speakers, none of whom I knew, but his um, Grace Archbishop Pell at the time was going to be there. And I thought, well, I know nobody in Melbourne. I was brand new. I thought, at least I'll get to meet people. And I went and my husband was really supportive because he knew I knew nobody. He looked after the kids and I mingled um, and there was a table there that changed my life. I, um, there was a table called um, Abortion Alternatives and on there there was um, images or photos of aborted babies, mm -hmm. um, dismembered babies. And I looked at them and I grabbed some and I ran out. And you held those photos to your heart yeah, I did. very closely, very tightly. Why? because it brought back mine. Um, as much as I've now worked in this area for 20 years, you never forget it. Mm -hmm. You don't. My two babies, um, Miriam and Joseph, I've spoken about them all around the world. Their names are known all around the world. Mm -hmm. um, they have a plaque in South Melbourne as a memorial. Um, but that very first time when I, I saw what happens to an abortion, because people use the word abortion, but nobody knows what an abortion is. Mm -hmm. We use the word abortion, mm -hmm. but nobody quite knows what an abortion is. Mm. Abortion is the dismembering of a baby. Mm. It's the cutting up mm -hmm. into pieces of a baby, which is nestling in its mother's womb. Mm. And we're going to come back to that and unpackage it a little bit more. Okay. okay. You're watching Support Life and we'll be back after the break. Welcome back to Support Life. I'm Gavin Bolch and my guest is Anne Lastman. Anne, you're sharing a very intimate, personal moment and sharing about two children, two children that you had aborted. Yes. In fact, um, that had been buried for some 20 years? At the time, yes. I hadn't spoken about them. They had remained silent. Um, in fact, I hadn't spoken about them at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the seeing the images on the photos just brought them to the surface. Yeah. And this is what normally happens with, with a post-abortion grief. It's a triggering event. It can be any, anything mm -hmm. that triggers a memory and then it brings it to the top. Mm -hmm. and then the grief begins. With me, I was having um, nightmares for years about dismembered babies, but I never ever connected dots. Mm -hmm. It never occurred to me what it was. I just thought it was, ba uh, it was a, a nightmare, mm -hmm. but I often thought it was maybe something I read. I never thought it was connected mm -hmm. to me because I'd suppressed 
the issue myself. So you had buried it and hidden it? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And now it comes to the surface and you can name it? I put a name to it and what it was. And the interesting thing was that once it was named, the nightmare stopped, which is what happens. Yes. Yeah. Now, for that experience, personal, real, mm -hmm. painful, mm -hmm. um, you've obtained courage from somewhere to stand with women and help them through their pain. Um, where, where does the courage come from? Where does the conviction come from? Well, it was very interesting because I, after that event, um, it slowly led to me meeting someone. Do you know, I come, I've come to the conclusion that whenever the Lord has a plan, he brings the right people. One by one, mm -hmm. the people come along. When he has a healing in store, mm -hmm. all the right people come along. He did that for me. Eventually, he led me to a priest psychologist who led me through a healing experience. And then he said, Anne, now you go and do this. What the Lord has done for you, you do for some to everybody else, for others. I said, yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, but I have. Yes. I I did do it. Um, it helped because I also did studies in the area of psychology. I did a Bachelor of Psychology counselling um, and then I continued with Masters in Theology um, in the spiritual area and other studies. But the thing was, I never really wanted to enter into counselling. It wasn't what I had planned. All my life I had wanted to enter into theology and lecturing. Did you see a pot of gold at the end of that rainbow, did you? Well, it wasn't so much, I, well, I really wanted to lecture in theology. I saw myself as a lecturer in theology, mm -hmm. not as a, uh, a counsellor. I never saw myself as a counsellor, mm -hmm. never, or even entertained it. I never saw myself as a counsellor, but I did see myself as a lecturer. Okay. And I think I told God that I saw myself as a lecturer and he started laughing loud. And 20 years later, next year will be 20 years and he's still laughing and I'm still laughing with him. Okay, but smiling laughing. Yes, it's a happy laughter. <laughs> <laughs> Some joy. Yes. Okay, so, but in, in counselling, mm -hmm. it's, it's a difficult pathway because who debriefs you? I, several, I have a couple of priest friends who help me. And I have a senior counsellor who I need to, I need to, as part of the registration, I need to debrief with um, supervision. Yes. yes, I need to do that. Yeah. And, and it's important and it's wonderful mm. that it, it is in place. Otherwise people... I'll burn out. Yes. yes, yes. I think when there's a call on our life, um, it, it, God doesn't intend us to burn out. No. He, he provides mm. us with community yeah. to see us through. Uh, which is very important. All right, so let's come back to some earlier years. Um, education uh, is something that you were able to enter into and do well at? Well, I actually stopped formal education in year 10. Oh. Yes, because I married the fir first time very young at 18. And then I started uni after my last boy went to school. So I didn't start uni till I was very old, mm -hmm. very so, old. So I think it works because there's um, maturity and a, yeah. and a will to finish well, and do I, well. Even though I didn't go to do all the normal studies, I'd always been a learner. So everything I could read, mm -hmm. I always read. Mm -hmm. And um, even now I've got 2,000 books at home and I keep buying because I love reading. So I'm a learner. And then you also write a lot. I absolutely do. We'll come back after the break. 
You're watching Support Life, and yes, we'll be back after the break. Welcome back to Support Life. I'm Gavin Bolch, and with me now is Anne Lastman. We've gone on quite a journey. Yes, uh, we have. You being one who likes to read, but also likes to write. But writing comes out of life's education, doesn't it? It absolutely does, yes. All right. Now, you shared earlier on that there was some pain that was hidden mm -hmm. and something released that and you could name it and you could, you could move forward with it. Mm -hmm. Have you written about that? I've written two books so far and I'm on, I'm on my third one. Two, um, the first one was on um, redeeming grief, which is um, about the experiences of post-abortion grief. Um, that came out of the work of dealing with women who've had abortions. Um, I loved that, writing that. The second one, which has only just come out a couple of months, in the last couple of months, is Hidden Pain, with um, sexual abuse of children within the family. That came out uh, as a result of me being fed up <laughs> with hearing um, about people wanting to talk about sexual abuse of children, but by priests. But my experience over 20 years is not priest or clerical abuse or priests, pastors, rabbis, because that's what the media brings to us. But my experience has been of children who later, as adults, who've come to me and have been abused within their family by fathers, brothers, uncles, aunties, um, mothers, um, even neighbours. Uh, not, I have not encountered a clerical abuse as yet. I'm not saying I won't, but I haven't so far. Mm -hmm. It's within the family. And that's, this book has come out as a, as a result of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I suppose in an indirect way, we can be thankful that we are uh, in a uh, community wide talking about the issue that sexual abuse is out there. Yep. Uh, and now it's the courage to look at, um, in fact, where it is taking place and to at least for families in some ways to to be aware of this and know that the earlier we talk about it the better and safer uh, things will be and also we'll be helping bring early healing is that right well it is but we need to be able to speak about it because the children suffer mm -hmm. um, if we can't get it out there I wrote this book especially for those, for teachers, for priests and pastors, for those in whose care children are in, so that when you see a child, a child can't keep a secret. Mm -hmm. Children don't know how to keep mm -hmm. secrets. Mm -hmm. They will give out some clues, some that that something isn't right in their life. Mm. Listen to that child. Mm. Be present to the child. They're saying something. Please listen because that child is hurting. Mm -hmm. Don't allow the child to walk through life feeling that they're alone and that no one's caring for mm. them. This is why the reason for this book it's not a, a Barbara Cartland book. It's not that type of book. It's His Grace Archbishop Hickey in Perth said, it's not a book, it's not an easy book to read, but it's a must read book. Mm -hmm. It's not easy. Mm -hmm. It's hard. Yeah. Well, it's not necessarily going to be on the New York bestsellers list, but- Absolutely not. Right, but um, there's a great need out there to just have the courage to read it. You might be a person who can help another. It's a book that will explain the trauma, 
what you can see, how you can see it. I'm not out there to attack anybody. It, mm. The book doesn't attack anybody. Mm. In fact, there's even a chapter on the clerg on clergy abuse. It doesn't attack the clergy. There's a, a, a chapter on the perpetrator. Mm. I don't attack the perpetrator mm. either because a perpetrator is a human being also. This week I was asked if a perpetrator is an animal. No, a perpetrator is not an animal because it's a human being mm. who's messed up their life. Mm -hmm. They are never an animal. Mm. A perpetrator is a human being who's got the breath of God in them. They've messed up their life. Mm. There's a chapter on forgiveness mm. and not to bring up the word forgiveness after the second uh, counselling session. That's ridiculous. Mm. You do not do that. Mm. Um, it's a very, as you say, it's not a, it's, it'll never make anybody's bestseller list. It's a hard book mm. to read. But those who have read it have said it was very good. Yes. It was, it, it was a very hard book to write. Yeah. Well, for those out there that, that have concerns and want to be informed mm -hmm. uh, for several reasons. One, um, what's happening to my children? Mm -hmm. uh, two, um, I don't want children to suffer any unnecessary pain. Mm -hmm. uh, three, um, if I'm a resource, I'm the sort of person that others come to to ask questions, to seek advice, then I'm equipped to take them further into the realm of healing, mm -hmm. redemption. Mm -hmm. There we are. You need to know that. Mm -hmm. If you don't know, if we don't know, also if you don't know what to look for. Mm -hmm. Remember, one of the things that I have learned is that, and what I have heard from these victims, the thing that stands out most of all is the word loneliness. Abandonment? Abandonment and loneliness. Loneliness is that they have been alone, that they, all through the years, that while this was happening, that there was no one that they could go to. And great counselling is a counsellor who can go back to every episode of abuse and sit with them and while they go through with it. Thank you for sitting with me and the audience tonight. Thank you. My pleasure. You've been watching Support Life. That's all for our program today. Join us again next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.